Bryce and I have been talking to people about meditation and the benefits of meditation because there's so much people can do to sort of take back control over their lives. And you have got a lot of experience of meditation, haven't you? I do. Yeah. I spent a lot of time meditating. Train your focus and not really know what you're doing. Yoga itself just means focus. What I like to refer people to is if they want to learn how to meditate, there's plenty of great ways out there. But the way my teacher then, his name's Kevin Bordelin, um, the way he learned when he was younger, he, he just went to India and he wanted to find a guru. That's kind of like, you know, the old school, but you know, that was the way at one point you did it. Yeah. And so he does that. He finds a teacher. And the first thing the teacher does is puts him in a room, gets a piece of paper, draws a circle, a black circle, posts it on the wall and says, stare at that for an hour. And to his shock, he really couldn't keep his attention on it. But this was a big circle. It's very big. Mm -hmm. And the more and more he did this practice, the better and better he got. And the smaller and smaller the circle got. So then you were able to just focus on that one circle in a meditation, being present and aware. But the thing is, you can train your focus and not really know what you're doing. So then there comes an understanding of being present. And once you get to this nothingness, you're doing it only in the practice. But when the benefits of the practice are way more easily felt and seen, when you're taking breaks, when you're walking, when you're eating, you find that you're so intimately connected with your being. And then what, what happens in that state of relaxation is healing. There were memories that I was having from childhood that would surface and I'd come to peace with them or memories of a past partner and I'd give forgiveness, you know, in that moment. But the cool thing is the practice is not anything woo-woo. It's, it feels totally scientific. I'm so glad you brought this up because that's, um, that's the whole traditional like yoga practice as well is people think yoga means union sun yoga means union yoga itself just means focus mm. the second sutra of the yoga sutras is yoga chitimbriti nirodaha which nirodaha does not mean silence because you can't really silence the brain it's mm. bringing it to a state of nothingness and that focal point so like i use the tristana method which is your breathing your asana, which is a seat for meditation, which is usually really uncomfortable. Like I laughed about leg behind the head. That's not comfortable. And you're focusing, you have nine different focal points, like looking at the nose and bringing the mind to that one pointed focus when you're really uncomfortable. Mm. You know, I, I think mm. in the West, we have this like misunderstanding about this, about meditation. We think it's supposed to be like relaxing and comfortable and nice and light and love. But most of the time, you got to go, you got to lean into the discomfort because that's, that's where, as one of my teachers used to say, that's where the potion is. That's where the potency is. That's where things get interesting is 100%. when you feel that anger coming up, when you feel that, you know, that, that um, attachment coming up and the samskara is like that for those who don't know what that is. That's like when you have like an old record or an old CD, like we had growing up um, and it would scratch, scratch, scratch. That's yeah. a samskara. And the more you allow that repetitive attachment to ingrain itself, the deeper that scratch gets. And you're, that's what makes you powerful. You're the one that gets, you're the only one who can really rectify that. And you do it through, it, it is. I mean, people think about meditation as, oh, you're just sitting. No, like you are going through, it is like the Bhagavad Gita. You're on the battlefield and you're having to like be there with, and you're, with your own self. And that's really hard. It's hard to sit with yourself. I like what you brought up is it's discomfort. It's learning how to be with discomfort. And I realized quite recently I was getting comfortable with comfort and I started to switch it up again. And what I did, I now I'm going to a sauna and there's an ice cold plunge that's right out of it. And yeah. then there's a float tank. And so I didn't get good at the cold plunge until I did the float tank. Because in the float tank, I realized how still I could get my mind. And then once I started to attempt the cold plunge, I realized the first time I couldn't even put half my body in. I just came right out. It was too cold. Second time I dipped in for a second and that was it. The third time, maybe 10 seconds. And then the fourth time it was like five minutes. 
And I realized it was because I, I took the, what I learned in floating and did it in there. I got my body as relaxed as I could and I wasn't fighting it. And then I was breathing like Wim Hof, but not too fast. And then I was doing it for 20 minutes and it's the most intense discomfort. But if you can be focused, have yoga, that's when I was able to keep going. But if my mind started to drift and think about whatever, nope, I'd get right out. Yeah. Can you guys see like the parallels with what, how most people live their lives and why we're talking about meditation? Because most of us have been are in societies where it's all about distraction. It's mm -hmm. all, everything is about distraction and it's so easy to keep yourself busy so that you don't have to focus. And actually, when you break free of that matrix, everything about your life changes. And so these practices, they're not just they're not just there to amuse yourself. They've got such a real life application that is going to change the way you see everything around you, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about this, Catherine, before about the ego and humility. And I've maintained as someone, I feel like I've been very fortunate in my life because I've been able to go to India multiple times and study under one of the most re renowned uh, Parm gurus in India. And also my teachers here in the United States that got me there. Um, I've had such an incredible, I've been very, I feel like I won the golden lotto ticket because I got real teachers, not just like yoga size, like real yoga teacher, like that were really interested in like the philosophy of Patanjali's um, theories with, with the mind. And it, it, what I've noticed too, is when you really walk into that path of real spirituality, that real, spe it's a path of walking on fire sometimes. And it brings you to a level of humility within mm. yourself as well. And when you, when you break into that level of humility, um, you open as well. Not, not, it's like I heard, and um, I, Shanti and I talked about this morning. It's like, the more that your heart breaks and the more you're able to lean into the heartbreak and rectify that within yourself, the more the light comes in and you recognize that in other people. And so that's part of that false, that illusion of the ego, which is the false, the false sense of reality or the false sense of self that we're always battling. And that's the fragile part of you that doesn't ever want to be wrong and wants to be perceived as, as the best versus the real part of you which is that continual loving consciousness. And it's that eyes, you see it, right? You're right, Nick, you see it in somebody's eyes. Even the yoga sutras talk about that. And these sutras are 5,000 years old. They oh, talk about when you, when you hit that awareness, you see it in the animals. You mm -hmm. recognize the same soul in the animal as well. Mm -hmm. And so there brings about this like level of, of calmness. That's why a lot of people who are in spiritual practices all of a sudden get real calm. Because every you realize everything around you is just an illusion anyway for your own awakening. Mm -hmm.